The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. The webinar will begin in one minute. Good afternoon and welcome to today's complimentary webinar titled External Review, Navigating Nuances in Regulatory and Market Trends. This webinar sponsored by RegQuest is our final offering in a series of three webinars that focused on various aspects of the medical management industry. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available to RegQuest subscribers. Depending on whether we have any time available following today's webinar, we may have a brief question and answer session with our guest speakers. My name is Katie Spivey, and I serve as Senior Legal Counsel of RegQuest. I started working for RegQuest parent company, Schooner Strategies, in 2011, and returned to work with our CEO, Gary Carneal, this past August, after spending two and a half years working on Capitol Hill. I worked for three different members, focusing on primarily on healthcare policy. In my current role with RegQuest, I oversee daily operations, the creation of new content, and customer and web support. With that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce today's expert speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Julie O'Brien, President of Allocare Medical Management and President of the Na National Association of Independent Review Organizations, NIRO. Ms. O'Brien has years of experience and invaluable insight into the external review process. As President of Allocare, Ms. O'Brien has complete oversight of all operations at AMM in New Hampshire and King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Ms. O'Brien provides leadership for all aspects of the call center, including clinical services, customer service, strategic marketing, and product development. She focuses on expansion of services through acquisition of new clients, strategic alliances, joint ventures, and overall performance of the company. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien, for being with us today. Next, I'd like to introduce Tom Naughton, President of the Health Division at Maximus Federal. Mr. Naughton is responsible for the management and performance of Maximus Federal's largest book of business, benefit appeals, and independent medical review services. His client base includes more than 60 federal and state agencies. Mr. Naughton also manages large-scale federal call and processing centers. He has extensive experience in healthcare reimbursement, Medicare, Medicaid, workers' compensation, state healthcare law, quality oversight, and peer review, and all forms of benefit disputes and dispute resolution programs. Thanks for being with us today, Tom. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Gib Smith. Mr. Gilbert P. Smith, JD, is an executive with more than 20 years extensive experience and expertise in project, program, and team management in both professional and nonprofit environments. As president of GPS Consulting Services, Mr. Smith provides corporate counsel and compliance services for a variety of clients, including accredited independent review organizations and related healthcare entities. Since 2008, he has been responsible for helping the National Association of Independent Review Organizations shape the healthcare industry related to the provision of independent medical review. In this role, Mr. Smith leads 31 member associations dedicated to the advancement of IMR. Thanks for being here. 
Before we begin the webinar, I'd also like to go over a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is the last of our series of three complimentary webinars sponsored by RegQuest. Other webinars focused on mental health parity and utilization management program. For those participants with us today who are not members of RegQuest, I will now provide a brief overview of our website and services. RegQuest is a regulatory compliance resource that details many of the business, legal, and regulatory forces directly impacting the medical management system. This user-friendly tool serves as the definitive guide to help users understand how these changes affect your system and your business. Current modules include utilization management and external review. Our third module, focusing on grievance and administrative appeals, will go live this summer. RegQuest is adding additional modules on state mental health parity laws and case management later this year. This slide shows a partial example of the information available to subscribers on RegQuest external review module. Each state survey includes information on the scope and applicability, regulatory information, program requirements, reviewer qualifications, reviews and appeals, and registration and licensure requirements. After gathering this information, we then send it directly to regulators for peer review. We keep this information up to date and send out push alerts to our subscribers, alerting them of any changes in statute or regulations. For more information on RegQuest, please feel free to contact me, Katie Spivey. My contact information will be displayed later on in the webinar. As you can see on this slide, this displays our navigational map. Subscribers can simply click on any state and have that state's information pop up. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tom Naughton, who will talk a little bit about Maximus. Tom? Thanks, Katie. Uh, Maximus Federal Services is a subsidiary of Maximus Inc., which is a publicly traded organization which specializes in the provision of government uh, health and human services programs. I'll talk a little bit about our independent review services. Maximus is the largest provider of government-sponsored independent benefit review programs in the United States. We only work uh, with government agencies. We do not uh, work with any health plans, provider groups, or uh, hospital organizations. Our major contracts are with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under the Qualified Independent Contractor Program. Through this program, uh, we provide independent review services for Medicare Parts A, C, and D. Uh, on the state side, we work with more than uh, 50 state regulatory agencies. Uh, we also serve as the federal external review contractor under the uh, Affordable Care Act. And uh, previously, we spent about seven years working with the Department of Defense under the National Quality Monitoring Contractor. We are completely independent. As I said, we have no insurer, facility, or provider uh, group contracts. We're one of the first uh, URAC accredited IROs. We have also had our independent review work uh, registered by the International Standards Organization, and we are recognized uh, by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as a quality improvement organization. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. Now I would like to uh, turn it over to Gibb Smith, who will talk a little bit about NIRO. Gibb? Thanks, Katie. Uh, the National Association of Independent Review Organizations was formed back in 2000 with eight members. We have grown to now 31 accredited IROs and affiliated members. Uh, NIRO's mission um, is dedicated to protecting the integrity of the uh, independent medical peer review processes and ensuring that all stakeholder interests are fairly represented. NIRO members utilize the expertise of thousands of board-certified clinicians throughout the country. These uh, clinicians serve on the various member panels. Uh, we are our members embrace an evidence-based approach to independent peer review in order to fairly help fairly resolve coverage disputes between enrollees and their health plans. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Deb. Now, Julie O'Brien will talk a little bit about AMM. Julie? Thank you, Katie. Yeah, Allocare Medical Management is a medical cost management company that has been in service since 1995, um, actually 1990. 
1995, we did our first accreditation. We have four UREC accreditations, which really speaks to the quality of services that we provide. And the book of businesses that we actually focus on are utilization review, case management, independent physician review, nurse helpline, disease management, wellness, maternity management, medical claims review, network referral, DRG validation, bill audit, readmission management, and disability management. We actually do focus on more of the health plans, physician groups, hospitals, PTAs, third-party administrations across the country. We have a national footprint. We're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're located in Salem, New Hampshire, White Plains, New York, and King of Prussia. Um, all of our service are in, based in the U.S. We don't outsource across the pond or anywhere. All of our um, clinicians are licensed uh, to provide these services in the states in which we provide them. And our programs can be offered individually or as a comprehensive integrated approach to care management. Wonderful. And so now let's uh, move into the first portion of our presentation by providing some background on external review and independent review organizations. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Julie, for that. Thank you, Katie. OK. So when a consumer receives notice that their health insurance claim has been denied, reactions often include confusion, frustration, and even anger. In addition to these reactions, appealing a denied claim can be a time of a very time-consuming affair. Even though such appeals can be daunting, it is no reason, it, it by no means is an isolated event. A 2011 study by the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that up to 24% of the claims are denied. According to a recent uh, consumer union study, most Americans don't know where to file an appeal. So two-thirds of the privately assured Americans today are uncertain about the state entity which is responsible for resolving issues and in health insurance billing. It's really a, an issue with navigation, and a lot of people have a lot of difficulty with that. So hopefully today we're going to give a little bit more of an understanding not only of how to do that, but what appeals mean and how, how they come to fruition. Uh, about 87% don't know the state agency or the department tasked with handling health insurance complaints. And about 72% are unsure if they have the right to appeal to the state an independent medical expert if their health plan refuses coverage for medical service that they think they need. Next slide, please. While many consumers are not aware of the important protections afforded by external review, these requirements have been in place for quite some time. Most of the protections were adopted in the late 80s and early 90s with the event of managed care. For example, most states adopted UM laws, the Utilization Review Accreditation Commission, which is now known as URAC, uh, was formed in 1996. And the National Committee for Quality Assurance, or NCQA, um, <clears throat> launched its UM accreditation standards, and NIAC adopted several model acts that were covered by these issues. And it really started to gain some speed. Some public policymakers began to voice concerns there was not enough transparency in the peer review process. Um, complaints began to mount, and the appeal process was tainted because it was run by health plan insiders. As a result, many states began to adopt another layer of external review, which you've heard about today. The external review protects a decade later to provide additional balance and check on the appeals process run by health plans. This has been provided to the birth of independent review organizations, or IROs, is what we call it. In 1999, NIRO teamed up with URAC, and NIRO is the National Association of Independent Review Organizations, to develop the first national set of accreditation standards, which published in March of 2000. In 2008, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, or NIAC, issued the Uniform Health Carrier external review model act which set forth baseline standards for health plans to adhere to when performing external review soon thereafter in 2010 the federal government built upon these standards with the enactment of the patient protection and affordable care act which we've all heard a lot about recently the ACA incorporated the NIAC model act by reference to supplemental state laws that were previously in place governing internal and external appeal rights so there's internal appeal rights where you're doing utilization review and the physician actually um, issues a determination on that utilization review. And then if it's a denial, they have the right to appeal it. And now they have an external appeal right as well. Next slide, please. 
as you can see, this slide goes into a bit more detail about the history of the medical management regulations, which is important to understand. Case management techniques and practices have been in place since the early 1990s, but we now know is medical management regulations really started to take shape in the late 70s when Michigan established independent review between health plans and patients. The first states to adopt the UN laws were Maryland and Louisiana in the late 1980s. Efforts continued finessing medical management regulations continue to this day as federal imp implementation of the Mental Health Parity Act um, is well underway today to ensure that we're treating the medical portion equal to the mental health portion. Next slide, please. Before we continue too much further down this rabbit hole, it should be useful for us to define some of the key terms, and I've thrown out a lot of um, acronyms out there. In the current marketplace, external review typically refers to a state or federal mandated appeal where the third party handles the external appeal after the utilization management internal appeal process is completed. So remember, I did speak about utilization has their determination and the member has the right to appeal. And once they've exhausted those rights, they have the right to an external appeal today. The phrase independent review can also mean the same thing as an external appeal, but it also can be described as the activities of a third party utilization management organization that is coming in to help run or part of the UM program for a health plan. So a physician can do the first level UM review. A specialty match physician has to do the appeal for that UM denial. And then another independent that hasn't seen the case before can provide the external review, a separate company in itself. In its Uniform Health Carrier External Review Model Act, the NIAC defines IRO as an entity that conducts independent external reviews of adverse determinations and final adverse determinations. So in an external review, the determination that is rendered by that physician actually becomes final and binding. An adverse determination is a determination by a health carrier or its designee utilization review organization that an admission, availability of care, continued stay, or, or health care services that is a covered benefit has been reviewed and based upon the information provided does not meet the health care's requirements for medical necessity, appropriateness, or health care setting or level of care. And the required service or payment for the service is therefore denied, reduced, or terminated. Next slide, please. Now that we have the terminology, terminology down, let's take a quick look at the appeals process. As many of you are aware, in most cases, the external review process kicks in after the internal appeal is complete. The internal appeal can be a UM appeal, a parity appeal, or in some cases, an administrative or grievance appeal. The external appeal can take the form of a review by an IRO, a review by a regulator, an audit by an accreditation body, or a judicial hearing. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Katie for an overview of the state regulations. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. That was really informative and helpful. Here at RegQuest, we aim to provide a comprehensive overview of medical management regulation. Uh, in February of this year, we actually released our inaugural 2016 trend report on utilization management regulations. And later this summer, we will be unveiling our 2016 trend report on external review regulations. Uh, and just as a side note, all of these reports are available free of charge to RegQuest subscribers. The meat of the report is a 50-state survey that actually examines state external review laws. And we'll take a look at some of the statistics of, that, um, of our findings shortly. As you can see, this slide highlights some of the trend report's major findings. First, there is widespread underutilization of external review programs. Even though the percentage of claim denials varies considerably among states, type of insurance plans, and population, a study performed by the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, actually found that coverage denials, if appealed, were frequently reversed in the consumer's favor. In spite of these high rates of appeal reversals, many individuals still do not file requests for the external review of denied claims. A study performed by AHIP found that, on average, less than one out of every 10,000 eligible individuals requested an external review of their denied health claim. 
secondly, there is increasing pressure to disclose the identity of a reviewer, which may actually lead to fewer specialists serving as reviewers and ultimately the price of reviews increasing. The current industry standard for IROs is to prevent the disclosure of the reviewer's identity unless required by contract, statute, or law. The rationale for this decision centers on maintaining the overall quality and integrity of the independent review. From a regulatory perspective, accredited IROs rely on Section 14 of the NIAC Model Act, the whole harmless provision, as their basis for reviewer anonymity. However, consumer advocates and treating providers have countered that disclosing a reviewer's identity allows for additional transparency in the review process. And finally, and perhaps most critically, the question of whether an IRO has a fiduciary responsibility to the patient has really come to the forefront. Uh, this is a critical issue that we dive into in the trend report, but due to, today, uh, to time constraints with today's webinar, we won't actually be looking about at this issue today. Now let's get into some of the findings from our 50-state survey. Today, 38 states and Puerto Rico have external review regulations in place that are considered NIAC parallel. An additional seven states and D.C. are considered NIAC similar. Of those states that have ER processes in place, the vast majority, 50 jurisdictions, apply these regulations to HMOs and insurers. Many jurisdictions also apply these regulations to uh, utilization review organizations, accountable care organizations, and third-party administrators. Finally, many states had at least one stated exemption to the ER regulations. Our 50-state review also looked at some program requirements pertaining to ER regulations. As you can see, 36 jurisdictions had a regulation pertaining to clinical review criteria. 49 jurisdictions had some prohibition against financial incentives. 34 jurisdictions required telephonic coverage or access to a reviewer phone number. 46 jurisdictions had some type of quality control assurance and 48 jurisdictions had a requirement pertaining to reviewer qualifications. We also looked at the varying time frames for ER programs. As you can see, the time frames for standard appeals varied from 10 to 60 working days, and a majority of jurisdictions actually required a decision to be made within three days or 72 hours for expedited reviews. Finally, 25 jurisdictions required a decision to be issued in conformity with the expedited or standard timeframes for experimental or investigational reviews. So those reviews followed the timeframes that the statute had provided for standard or expedited reviews. To end this section, uh, let's take a, a look at three different states. One state that has recently come into compliance is Montana. As of January 1st, 2016, the state is now NIAC parallel. In adopting the new regulatory scheme introduced as Montana Senate Bill 83, uh, uh, adopt NIAC external review model laws, the title of the bill, Senator Christine Kaufman, the bill sponsor, said, this legislation will create transparency and accountability in the appeals process for healthcare treatment decisions by insurance companies by adopting the NIAC external review model law. This will create a uniform structure of appeals for all health plan issuers and prioritize appeals that may have life and death consequences. California had actually had an independent medical review process in place for more than a decade by the time the ACA was enacted. This program required state-regulated health plans to provide consumers with the opportunity for an independent external review of coverage denials. The ACA expanded this requirement to self-insured group plans. Uh, from 2001 to 2010, nearly 12,000 Californians took advantage of this program and obtained an independent medical review. And finally, uh, Florida, uh, their external review program does not meet the, NA, the NIAC standards as set forth in the Model Act. The state actually issued a bulletin in October of 2011 informing health insurance issuers of the fact and informing them that they could participate in the federal review process. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tom Naughton, who will provide some information on federal regulations. Tom? 
Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Katie. So we're really just going to run down uh, some of the larger uh, federal external review programs and uh, then talk about uh, some of the nuances of those programs and give a little detail on, on the uh, federal external review program under the Affordable Care Act. So really the largest uh, external review program in the United States and in the, in the federal space is uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Qualified Independent Contractor Program. Uh, that covers all parts of Medicare, uh, parts A, B, C, D, uh, and DME. If folks are familiar with uh, the uh, recovery audit contractors, the RACs, and other fraud or recovery contractors such as ZPICs, uh, providers that are uh, dispute findings of the RACs and the ZPICs have a right to appeal to the QUIC program along with standard Part B and Part A providers as well as enrollees. I have appeal rights there. Uh, the federal external review process that's under the Affordable Care Act and we'll talk about that in a later slide. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management uh, has a external review program for the uh, Federal Employees Health Benefit Program that covers all federal employees have a right to external review. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management also has the uh, multi-state plan appeal program which is a, a program that was created under uh, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, the Defense Health Agency has the TRICARE Quality Monitoring Contract, which allows uh, act, uh, military members to appeal uh, denials, and there's also some provider appeal work in that. Uh, what is interesting is uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, does not have uh, any external review programs or appeal programs for its non-VA care. Uh, the Social Security Administration does not uh, have any independent uh, appeal programs uh, for denials. All of those programs are performed by uh, federal employees or doctors who are contracted uh, with uh, Social Security Administration. Next slide, please, Kate. So uh, some of the nuances of uh, federal external review programs, they're more inclusive. So in Medicare, uh, coverage appeals are, are allowed for enrollees. Uh, that's generally not allowed for uh, in state external review programs. As I mentioned, providers have appeal rights uh, under the Medicare program and other uh, federal programs. Uh, in state appeal programs, most often only consumers have that appeal right. Uh, doctors can work with consumers to have the consumers appeal, but in most states, providers cannot appeal on their own. Uh, coding and payment issues are frequent uh, issues seen in uh, federal appeal programs. These are not seen in uh, state programs because, again, it's consumer appeals who are appealing a denial of services. There are states, a handful of states that do have uh, provider appeal programs, which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation. Uh, rescission appeals are also uh, part of uh, federal appeal programs and not included in uh, state programs. Many federal programs have simplica simplified application processes, particularly in Medicare. So in state programs and under the uh, NAIC Model Act, consumers are responsible for uh, filling out applications, establishing that they're qualified and have gone through all the previous uh, appeal processes to uh, receive entitlement or approval for an external review. As an example, in Medicare, uh, a Medicare enrollee that is denied uh, at a plan level of care will receive a letter that says, you know, You've been denied at this level. We are forwarding your case to the next level of review. So a, a Medicare enrollee is not responsible under Part C for filling out their own application or ensuring that they are qualified uh, for an external review, which is a significant difference between uh, state programs. There's greater centralization and oversight. Uh, just as an example, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, ERISA plans can either uh, work under the Federal External Review Program or can contract uh, with three 
IROs almost exclusively. ERISA plans contract with three IROs, and the Department of Labor has uh, very little oversight of uh, what goes on in those programs, uh, volumes, and, and other issues associated with that. Whereas in the Medicare program and other federal programs, you're talking about uh, one or two national contractors. Therefore, regulators and plans and other stakeholders have a significant understanding of what's going on uh, throughout the country. And it gives a, a much better uh, sort of transparency to the programs. They also experience higher volumes. That's not only because uh, they have higher enrollment rates, but again, uh, simplified application processes and really one, one process to go through. So you're talking uh, on the Medicare, across the Medicare program, uh, probably a million appeals a year. Uh, when you look at the state external review programs, uh, you know, California, which is a, a larger volume state, uh, approximately 3,000 uh, for the year. And if you look at a smaller volume state, uh, such as uh, Michigan, yeah, maybe a couple hundred, and then a micro volume state of Indiana, probably less than 50 uh, external reviews a year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just going on the, uh, a little bit on the ACA requirements. I'm sorry. Uh, when ACA was enacted, 47 states had laws in place requiring independent review. Uh, health plan issuers were required to uh, make sure they complied with either the state's external review process or the federal external review process. And and sorry about that. And ERISA plans could I as I said could either participate in the uh, federal external review process or uh, contract with three accredited IROs. What's interesting is that Sorry about that, I lost contact. What's interesting is that the federal process is a floor and states have the ability to pass more stringent standards. However, while the federal process includes uh, appeals and uh, coverage appeals, many of the states, although they are uh, compliant with the NAIC Model Act, they provide uh, a narrower appeal rights uh, than the federal external review process provides. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, now I'd actually like the panel to give us uh, some insight on a few trends facing the uh, external review industry. To begin, uh, Tom, would you be willing to talk a little bit about the underutilization of external review? Sure. Thanks, Katie. Uh, as I mentioned, you, there's, and as Katie mentioned, there's a significant underutilization of external review. Uh, according to the AMA's 2013 report card, if we look at a company as large as Sigma across the country, they have very low uh, claim denials, and uh, with, with Medicare at the, at a 4.92%. Um, the GAO has found that 39% of internal appeals were reversed in favor of the consumer on an external review. And as AF has found out, on average, that less than one of every 10,000 eligible individuals uh, have requested an external review. And then you look at a state like the state of Ohio, uh, with approximately 12 million uh, residents and consumers, and they've had less uh, than 2,000 external reviews. In, in almost a decade. Again, what we see as the underutilization is it is a, a long process for the consumer to go through. It is a confusing process for the consumer to go through. They really don't understand uh, how to fill out their applications. They don't really understand the process, as Julie mentioned earlier. And uh, 
I think with more education and streamlined application processes, you would see a uh, greater utilization of external review. Thanks. Great. Uh, so now let's turn to Julie, who will speak a little bit about uh, conflicts of interest. Julie? Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Yeah, conflict of interest is an interesting topic, and I'm sure a lot of you saw the Anthem podcast for 15 minutes about conflict of interest. So it's very important for us to um, get across the messaging about how our organizations are run, and really, if you're going to have any independent review, you should align yourself with someone who is accredited to ensure that all of the state laws and all the regulations are being followed. So as Tom alluded to, although the rate of appeals is low, mitigating potential and actual conflict of interest is a critical issue for IROs. A conflict of interest severely damages the integrity of independent review process, both for the internal and external reviews. Transparency between stakeholders is important to maintain this review integrity. Generally, both states and accredited IROs consider it a conflict of interest if the same IRO reviewer and in many cases, the same IRO performs both the internal and external review on a particular appeal. Remember, I did speak about the steps of the appeal process. On the UM determination, there's a reviewer, a doctor that reviews that and makes an adverse determination, a denial. It is then appealed, and that has to be a specialty match reviewer in the same or similar treating as the provider and it has to be independent. They can't have seen the case, they can't have any knowledge of the case, they can't have any association with the institution, anything that would present a conflict, they have to separate themselves and stay from that review if they have any, any relationship at all. And all other reviewers actually sign an attestation of conflict of interest on each and every case they review. And that's part of the accreditation process. Uh, let's see. It's the same, I, uh, in many cases, the same IRO performance both the primary for that. And I'm saying that no year after accredited IROs will accept an external review of press and appeal. They have already reviewed the claim as an internal appeal. Additionally, most states will not assign an external review request to an IRO that has had previous involvement with the case presenting a conflict of interest. So we want to try to avoid that. The majority of states considered to be NIAC parallel um, have adopted the conflict of interest language from the NIAC Model Act, which states the IRO and the clinical reviewer assigned to conduct an external review may not have a maternal, material, professional, familial, or financial conflict of interest with the following. The insurer or the plan that is the subject of the external review, the claimant, and any related party to the claimant whose treatment is the subject of the external review, any officer, director, or management employee of the insurer, the plan administrator, plan fiduciary, or plan employee. The health care provider, the health care provider's group, the practice associated with the health care provider, and the facility which the recommended treatment would be provided, or the developer or manufacturer of the principal drug, device, procedure, or other therapy being recommended. While it is critically important to avoid conflict of interest, the IROs are largely undertaking measures to avoid conflicts, including checking organizational and staff conflicts upon receipt of review, checking reviewer conflicts prior to assigning a case review, and if an organizational conflict or staff conflict is found, notifying the assigning entity for the resolution and ensuring that reviewer abstains from that review. So that's kind of a high level of conflict of interest, but it's imperative that we get across the messaging that conflict of interest is important for us to acknowledge that we do not participate in that and that anybody associated with accreditation has to maintain no conflict of interest. And I'll send it back to Katie. Great. Uh, now, Gib, would you like to take us through the role of accreditation? Sure, sure. I just wanted to make a few points about accreditation as it relates to the external review process. So most states in the Affordable Care Act require IRS to be accredited to perform external review. This is, this is a critical point. Um, generally, there are two types of IROs in the market today. We have accredited IROs, non-accredited IROs. Uh, there are approximately 48 accredited IROs. Currently, there is not an accurate count on accredited on unaccredited IROs. IRS, excuse me. In the external review world, it is important to use an accredited IRO. 
Um, the reason for this is that IRS accreditation standards provide additional oversight mechanisms to supplement federal and state external review regulations. Accreditation is able to accomplish this by requiring IRS to meet certain review quality and performance standards, including conflict of interest avoidance, reviewer credentialing, and minimum reviewer qualifications. For example, under the NIAC Model Act, it requires that IROs must meet the following minimum qualifications. One, they need to be an expert in the treatment of the covered person's medical condition that is under review. Two, they must be knowledgeable about the recommended service or treatment through recent or current clinical experience treating patients with the same or similar medical condition as a covered person. Three, they must hold a non-restricted license in the U.S. for physicians a current certification by a recognized American Medical Specialty Board in the area appropriate to the subject of the external review. And finally, number four, it must have no history of disciplinary actions or sanctions that raise a substantial question as to the clinical reviewer's physical, mental, or professional competence or moral character. Lastly, Accreditation standards for IROs help promote and protect the integrity of the external review process. It is NIRO's position that using an accredited IRO for reviews is in all stakeholders' best interests. Back to you, Katie. Fantastic. Now let's go back over to Tom for more information on alternative benefit appeal programs. Tom? Thanks, Katie. So, as I mentioned, and as Julie's mentioned, and Gibbs mentioned, historically, external review programs in the states cover uh, just consumer appeals for service denials. Uh, and in the last uh, 10 years, and in the last couple of years, uh, states have been evolving uh, and setting up new programs. So, uh, back in 2007, uh, the state of New Jersey uh, set up a claims arbitration program for providers and payers who were involved in uh, coding and uh, payment disputes. And uh, this is a zero budget program for the states. The provider pays half of the arbitration application fee and the payer pays the other half of the application fee. And it is also the only door for payers and providers to go to after the providers exhausted uh, internal appeals. And it is a final and binding determination. And after about four years of running that program in, uh, in 2010, uh, approximately 10,000 uh, arbitrations were completed with approximately 30 million in additional payments going to providers, which was shocking to a lot of people and got a lot of attention. Uh, what happened after that, though, was, was quite interesting. The plans and the providers began uh, negotiating uh, in different in-network contracts, and many of the providers uh, that had been out of network uh, went in network. And the plans also started publicizing, I put that in quotes, their out of network rates. So providers had a greater understanding of what to expect uh, for payment if they were to treat out of network patients. And so that program, which did 10,000 uh, arbitrations in, in 2010, has done less than 4,000 arbitrations since then which really shows that uh, stability has come to the market and the payers and the providers have learned to negotiate uh, more reasonably and, and more folks are in network. So it's a very interesting case study for a provider appeal program. Similarly, uh, in Maryland, uh, Maryland established a, a Medicaid uh, provider appeals program that allows uh, Medicare, Medicaid providers to uh, appeal uh, payment denials and uh, medical necessity denials as well. And uh, that program is just starting, but it's seen, uh, uh, comparatively speaking, it's seen uh, significant volumes. In, in about a year, it's probably seen over a thousand cases, which compared to the states of uh, Maryland size and, and the larger states as well, that's a significant volume. And there's also a program uh, started under the Affordable Care Act for long-term care reviews in which enrollees have the right to appeal uh, denial of benefit triggers for long-term care insurance. Uh, every state uh, needs to provide these appeals 
Uh, again, we're seeing uh, generally very low volume. So in, in one state, you may see anywhere from 3 to 12 external reviews in this area. And we also think, again, it's because the consumers don't understand the program and are also required to proactively complete applications and make sure that they have all their uh, information in mind to make sure they're qualified for the external review. Thanks, Kate. You ready for me? Hello? Deb, why did you take it on? I'm sorry, Deb. Deb. I was on I was on mute. <laughs> I'm so sorry no. about that. Uh, no, Deb, no. will you go ahead and discuss a little bit about reviewer anonymity and disclosure? <laughs> uh, the delay was for dramatic impact, right? <laughs> um, so as as Katie mentioned earlier. Reviewer anonymity has become a hot topic amongst external review stakeholders. As she also mentioned, the, the current standard is to prevent disclosure of the reviewer's identity unless required by contract, statute, or, or law. I believe only a risk is required for disclosure of the reviewer's name as upon the request of the claimant. Um, IROs argue that this anonymity shields reviewers from undue influence and harassment. They claim that uh, such anonymity allows the viewers to make the most appropriate decisions without outside pressure from a variety of stakeholders. Uh, in the last couple of years, NIRO has seen a trend where treating providers are releasing fewer names to the appellant. There have been several recent instances where appellants have contacted viewers directly and threatened them with physical harm and or legal action for their external review recommendations. As a result of this trend, IROs have worried that the qualified reviewers may decline to participate in the independent review process, which could severely limit reviewer availability access and limit the overall scope of reviewer coverage from both a geographic and specialty perspective. On the other hand, consumer advocates argue for additional transparency and argue that reviewers' names should be disclosed. In an effort to address this issue, many IROs provide a blinded biography of the reviewer. This biography generally includes uh, the reviewer's credentials, such as their board certification, their licensure, years of experience, and areas of expertise. Many IROs also require the reviewer to sign an attestation to these review, confirming that they possess the requisite credentials and appropriate specialty to render an expert opinion on the external review issue. Obviously, there are advantages and disadvantages to revealing the reviewer's identity. Uh, we believe this will likely continue to be debated over the next several years by policymakers and others about how to best balance the interests of consumers, payers, and reviewers without compromising the integrity of the external review process. Back to you, Katie. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, since we still have a few more minutes left, I'd like to do just a few quick questions, uh, present a few quick questions to the panel. Uh, first, what are the biggest challenges facing IROs, and what are some effective ways to mitigate these challenges? Well, I mean, this is Gib, and I think Tom discussed this in detail. But I think underutilization of the external review process is a, is a big, big issue. And I think the best way to mitigate that is through consumer education. And Nairo has been working diligently to address this problem, but I, we think, or I think, it's going to take all stakeholders uh, to educate. Um, consumers about their rights. And I, I really did like, uh, I, I actually, I did find Tom's point about the auto escalation and the, uh, in the federal market to be very interesting and compelling and perhaps a, a potential solution. Um, I don't know if Tom would like to weigh in on that a little bit more, but the, uh, well, I think that's the best. Yeah, but, you know, is underutilization, is underutilization a frustration? I think it's a frustration of the program because 
you know, consumers don't understand it, and therefore they get frustrated, and they get frustrated with the payers, and you know, there's there's access for them to have their dispute at least heard. You know, whether it's overturned or upheld is not really the point, but giving consumers the education and understanding of where they can go if they want to go, I think leads to greater consumer satisfaction and uh, greater understanding of how uh, you know managed care systems work so that they do not have a, a, as much frustration going forward and understand external review really gives consumers a better understanding of their rights and responsibilities under managed care what are covered benefits what are medical necessity issues things of that nature so again leading to as Gibb said greater outreach and education of the programs and consumer engagement uh, will be uh, very helpful for for the entire uh, not only external view but for uh, payers as well I, I this is Julie and I can't agree more with Gibb and Tom I think communication is key and having patients and consumers understand the process and what really goes into it rather than some blurb that they saw in 60 minutes trying to mitigate all of that negativity and turn it over to what really happens in all of our world is imperative and paramount to the success of getting everyone to understand the process and how to navigate the healthcare system which is onerous in itself. Absolutely. I think those are, are great points and uh, you know external review is such an important part and such an impor uh, important consumer protection that uh, your your points are all really well taken about increasing our um, our education efforts. Uh, last question: Do you think that the Affordable Care Act helped or hindered the external review process? So, this is good. In my opinion, I, I think it helped in the sense that it it sort of validated the NIAC uniform health carrier external review model act um, that was originally I guess passed or completed in 2008 and at that point it was really just seen as a set of guidelines that you that, you know you could follow if you, you so choose with the passage of the Affordable Care Act it sort of helped make what were really uh, various and distinct state external review processes become more uniform and I think more effective, much easier to follow, much easier to understand. And uh, I think in that regard, it, it did help. Yeah, yeah I would agree that overall uh, it was is helpful in that it's uh, bringing uh, states together in compliance with uh, one set of rules. I think there are things that continue, need to be continued to address to help the programs evolve. And again, really focus on uh, consumer education, provider education, and, and payer education so that all stakeholders understand their rights and responsibilities under the programs. And I would echo the yeah. same thing. I think it brought uniformity and compliance amongst all the people doing the reviews, and it allowed the consumer to understand there is a defined process that everybody follows. And, and I think or so I've heard, and we've been tracking this, that the uh, the External Review Model Act is up for revision, I think, in the next year or so. Um, and that's an opportunity to work out some of the kinks that Tom mentioned earlier um, and maybe address this consumer education piece as well. So we are tracking that closely. Great. Yes, and that's wonderful. I for one, definitely look forward to seeing if, uh, if any of the issues that you all have uh, pointed out are, are addressed. And with that, um, I would like to extend a big thank you to all of our panelists for being with us today. You uh, have really shared some invaluable information. And on behalf of uh, RedQuest and all of the participants today, thank you. Also, a big thank you to everybody who registered for today's uh, webinar. As promised earlier, uh, here is my contact information for RegQuest. You can email me at cspivey at regquest.com or give me a call at 443-808-0818.
I've also included uh, Julie O'Brien's contact information uh, for Allocare Medical Management. Uh, you can shoot her an email at julieobrien at allocaremed.com or give her a call at 1-800-863-8688. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. We hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and found it helpful. Please uh, take a moment to uh, review our webinar uh, descriptions that are available on regquest.com. And please feel free to contact me for additional information. Thank you so much, and have a great day.